We're going to pick up in Micah chapter 1. Go ahead and turn there. And while you do, let's talk about what makes the prophets so difficult. What makes them so inaccessible. There's a couple of things that are unique to the prophets. Prerequisites, requirements for us to understand them well. Um, And those can often make the books inaccessible to us. Uh, The first is that the prophets, unlike any other books in our Bible, require an extensive understanding of history and geography. Right? In the narrative books, the history kind of goes along with it, and if the geography is important, it will tell you so. Uh, but in the prophets, in Micah, it uh, is written to people who are living present tense history. Right? They just like you know the general outlines of. Uh, of World War I and World War II, and you know about Russia's invasion in uh, Ukraine right now, so also they know all of these things that are to us ancient history. And it's true of geography. Tonight, we're going to list off maybe a dozen different cities. I bet some of you, a very small few of you, could point to one of them on a map, and that's because it's Jerusalem. Right, uh, And so it's full of names of places and cities and kingdoms and nations that are not familiar to us. So that's one issue. The second is that the prophets are extensively imagery driven. And not even in a way that the Psalms are. We're, we're almost prepared for poetry to be poetic. But the prophets are... Uh, baskets of figs and fire and brimstone and melting mountains and, uh, you know, all of these different visions and images and stuff. And it, it requires additional interpretation. The meaning is not always evident. And even though your language, English, is full of metaphor, it's English metaphors, it's American metaphors, it's things that you get naturally that you don't even really think about metaphorically because you just hear it. You know, if I say grab the bull by the horns, you're not really picturing an animal, you're thinking about seizing the day, right? And it would be the same for them, but we are outsiders. And then the third thing that makes the prophets especially inaccessible to us is that they, they major on judgment. That's a primary focus, like most of the prophets, major or minor, uh, Isaiah or Hosea, they are two-thirds judgment and one-thirds hope. And so by the time we get to the New Testament, when we keep all judgment conveniently contained in the book of Revelation, and so we just have to stop reading a little bit early if we don't want to deal with those things, the prophets put it front and center. It's their primary focal point. It's their primary message. And so for all those reasons, the books can often be inaccessible. However, they are vital for helping us to connect our Christian theology with our Christian lives. They're vital for helping us to understand what God expects of us in the world, the world that's made not only of rock and soil, but of institutions and nations and kingdoms and war and poverty and all of these things. And so it's vital that we grow in our ability to interpret the prophets, and it's my hope as we go through the Micah that I'll be able to help you navigate through some of the inaccessibility. But again, before we read tonight, let me remind you that our agenda as we move through this book is to try and use Micah to get a lens for a uniquely Christian, or maybe we could say a biblical view of justice. So with that in mind, let's read all of chapter 1 through, and then we'll pray. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. The vision he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear, you peoples, all of you. Listen, earth and all who live in it, that the sovereign Lord may bear witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Look, 
The Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads on the heights of the earth. The mountains melt beneath him, and the valleys split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. All this is because of Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the people of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of rubble, a place for planting vineyards. I will pour her stones into the valley and lay bare her foundations. All her idols will be broken to pieces. All her temple gifts will be burned with fire. I will destroy all her images, since she gathered her gifts from the wages of prostitutes. As the wages of prostitutes, they will again be used. Because of this, I will weep and wail. I will go about barefoot and naked. I will howl like a jackal and moan like an owl, for Samaria's plague is incurable. And it has spread to Judah. It has reached the very gate of my people, even to Jerusalem itself. Tell it not in Gath. Weep not at all. In Beth Ophrah, roll in the dust. Pass by naked and in shame, you who live in Shephir. And those who live in Zanan will not come out. Beth Hazel is in mourning. It no longer protects you. Those who live in Meroth writhe in pain, waiting for relief because disaster has come from the Lord, even to the gate of Jerusalem. You who live in Lachish, harness fast horses to the chariot. You are where the sin of the daughter of Zion began, for the transgression of Israel was found in you. Therefore you will give parting gifts to Moresh of Gath. The town of Ezekiel will prove deceptive to the kings of Israel. I will bring a conqueror against you who live in Marisah. The nobles of Israel will flee to Adullam, Shave your head in mourning for the children in whom you delight. Make yourselves as bald as the vulture, for they will go from you into exile. Let's pray. God, we need illumination, we need discernment, we need your wisdom, and we need the help of your spirit tonight. And as we look at the book of Micah, and as we seek for a Christian vision of justice, would you just guide our ways? Would you clear the road? Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear? I pray as well, Lord, that we can see your character and your heart as we open your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You see what I mean about it being inaccessible? It's challenging, right? It's, It's almost difficult, especially in that second half, to hold your attention, right? It seems like the last time you had a Uh, an anchor to put your foot in or uh, something to hold on to was verses ago and yet you have to keep on reading. So let me give you some context so you can understand. Micah was a prophet both to Judah and to Israel. And when I make that distinction there, just in case you're newer to studying the Bible, here's what happens. During the reign of Solomon, because of Solomon's misbehavior, the kingdom of Israel is split into two parts. And so from that point on, Israel has two kingdoms, and it has two kings, and it has two capital cities. One in Judah, with Jerusalem as the capital, and the line of David as king, so David, and then Solomon, and Solomon's son Jeroboam, and so on down the line. And then there are the ten northern tribes, and their capital is Samaria. And they move through like 11 different dynasties due to assassinations as one person reigns and another person reigns. Eventually, those ten tribes are sacked by an up-and-coming power called Assyria. And Micah actually is communicating the impending judgment on the northern tribes of Assyria, but he's also warning that judgment is coming for Judah as well. In fact, if you look at the opening verse there, the word came to the Lord, uh, the word of the Lord came to Micah of Moresheth during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Those are all descendants of David that ruled consecutively. And so it's during the days of Jotham and Ahaz that uh, that's about a decade, almost uh, 20 years of time right in there. That's when Micah's ministry starts, and that's when. Uh, things change from 
Turn around, northern tribes. Watch out, northern tribes, to now your fate is inescapable. Here comes Assyria to bring about judgment. But notice also the last king on the list is King Hezekiah. And Hezekiah is told that not only is judgment of Assyria going to come on the ten tribes, but it's also going to come on Judea. And wisely, in the last moment, Hezekiah leads the remnant of Judea as they're gathered behind the walls of Jerusalem in repentance, and Assyria retreats. But the repentance doesn't last, and so Micah also points beyond his life to a time when judgment will come also to Judea. Okay. In fact, we're told, although it's not stated here in the book of Micah, we're told in Jeremiah 26, that it's through the words of Micah, alongside the ministry of Isaiah, that Hezekiah heard and responded to and repented because of it. Okay? So all of that to say that Hezekiah's ministry was effective, at least in its beginning. He said something was going to happen. He warned that it was going to happen. First, he said Assyria is going to come in and take the ten tribes, going to destroy Samaria, that actually happened. And he also said, if you don't repent, you're going to Jerusalem as well. And they did repent. Okay, and so that's the context of Hezekiah's life. And he continues on into the ministry of Hezekiah away, and then he dies. Um, but his message points beyond that, as we will see. But see, here's the thing, uh, another issue we sometimes have with the prophets. We usually are introduced to the prophets through the ministry of Moses, or maybe Elijah and Elisha. And so when we approach the books that are the prophets, what we're looking for is a historical narrative of the works and words of the prophet who the book is named for. And in places, you will find those things. You'll find Jeremiah in a pit, for example. You'll find things that happen, but what we can miss is unlike the record of Elijah and Elisha that we find in 1st and 2nd Kings, the book of Micah is a work of literature written by the author that contains his messages, represents his ministry, but has been turned into a literary work. Okay? And so, again, this can be a challenge with reading the prophets. They're rarely chronological. What we read here is not Micah's first message, his coming out party as a prophet where he says, I am a prophet of the Lord and this is my first message. Instead, it's the introduction to the book of Micah. Now what do you try and do with an introduction in a literary work? You try and introduce all of the themes and all of the characters that are going to be vital to understand the rest of the book. That's what chapter one is. And so, let's look again here. It says that this book contains, the end of verse 1 there, the visions he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. And what does he do first in verse 2? Hear you people, all of you, listen earth and all who live in it, that the sovereign Lord may bear witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Who is Micah's audience here? Where does he start? It's universal. Do you see that? He begins with kind of a hear ye, hear ye, right? He tries to gather all attention. If he were standing and giving this message, and we believe that most of the messages recorded in the books of the prophets were probably repeated day after day after day as people came in of, into Jerusalem and out of Jerusalem, right? It, it, was, it was repeated messages. And so here he gathers all the attention, but it's universal, but it doesn't stay universal. We see here in verse 3 that it's a word of judgment. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and he treads on the heights of the earth. And the first thing that happens in his appearance, it says in verse 4, that the mountains melt beneath him. Now pause. When it says there that God comes down and treads on the heights, or maybe in your translation it says on the high places, two things should come to your mind. First, the heights are the places that are high. It's pretty simple. They're, they're not valleys. They're the high places. Okay? But I want you to notice here that the high places are below God. Right? They're the place that he stoops down to. It's the place that he actually has to come low to interact with. You may remember that in another prophet it says that God has 
set my feet like hinds feet on high places. High places in this sense are a place of security. They're a place of safety. They won't protect you from God. Right? They, he, he comes down to the high places, but there's another meaning, and what is implicit here becomes explicit later. In Israel, and in the surrounding people, the nations that took up the land of Canaan, the high places were the unsanctioned places where other gods were worshipped, or the God of Israel was worshipped in unsanctioned ways. Okay? And if you read, starting with Samuel through Kings and Chronicles, you'll find these high places are a constant hindrance in the holiness of Israel. In fact, sometimes the kings of Israel are specifically judged as being good kings, but they left intact the high places of Israel. That's the first place where we get a hint of what Micah wants to talk about. But at, at this point, it's just God coming down, the whole earth listening in, the mountain's mouth beneath, beneath him. Right? This is a, uh, a, a literally an earth-shattering event. Okay. He's going to rock their world. And then he tells us why. Verse 5, all of this is because of Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the people of Israel. Now, like I said, I know uh, in our modern world, especially if you've grown up in kind of a, a, a middle-class suburban lifestyle, judgment is something that you struggle to relate to, struggle to resonate with. It's, it's a difficulty in the Bible. It's hard to chew. But that wouldn't have been the case for Israel. Why? Because Israel was a tiny, non-powerful nation in the midst of a geopolitical ground for more land, right? They lived through, the people of Israel, all four of the great conquerors of history, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and then Greek, which was assumed by Rome, right? That's Israel's entire history. It's right there, starting with where we are in Micah and moving all the way forward. On top of that, they knew the wickedness of the nations around them and the danger that it put, uh, put them in, and they understood, as we must come to understood, that judgment and salvation go hand in hand. For Israel to be saved from the nations requires the judgment of the nations. And so when the prophets come and they talk about God coming in judgment, or if you read the Psalms and God coming in judgment, what they're expecting to hear is judgment on their wicked, threatening, conquering neighbors. So again, we can imagine their ears perk up, and they're going, oh, what's going on here? And they gather together, and maybe they're even nodding along. Yes, our God is powerful. He's a consuming fire. He's going to set things right. And then he says, but he's coming because of your sin, Israel, because of the transgressions of Jacob. And then he answers the question, what, what's the problem? And so he says, what is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? Now again, the capital city of the northern tribes is Samaria. And to be honest, the Judeans, Micah is a Judean, his ministry mostly takes place in Judea. They'd still be nodding along going, yeah, that's right, they've really lost their way. They've been listening for years to the danger that the northern tribes find themselves in, the judgment that God is going to bring in. It may even be at this point that the armies of Assyria are at the very gates of the land of Israel. And they're starting to go, oh my gosh, when we first started hearing about this, when our grandparents heard about this, Assyria was a far off land with no power. Okay? It's like saying that Scotland was going to conquer the U.S. But over decades of time, they had watched as Assyria grew and grew in power, and suddenly they really were the threat that God had promised. But then notice here, what is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? And do you hear the record scratch there? This is Jerusalem. The city of David. This is Jerusalem, where the temple is, where the Ark of the Covenant is. And how is it referred to here as Mount Zion? No, as a high place. Deserving of judgment. So he says in verse 6, Therefore I will make, a, make Samaria a heap of rubble, 
a place for planting vineyards. I will pour her stones in the valley and lay bare her foundations. Okay, judgment is coming. Now, before we look at verse 7, I want you to notice something significant here. Micah opens talking about the destruction of Samaria. Now, when he starts his verbal ministry, he says Samaria is going to fall. Samaria is standing. When he publishes the book of Micah, Samaria is gone. So when he talks here, and he goes, you remember what I said? It came to pass just like I said. Okay. And that's something you will find consistently as you read the prophets. The early parts of the prophets, it doesn't matter if we're talking about Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Micah, most of the minor prophets. The first part of the book will focus on things that came to pass in the days of the prophets. Now, why would that be? Because it validates the things they said will come to pass after they die. In fact, if you read the book of Deuteronomy and it's laying a framework for prophets, it says, one day God will send a prophet just like Moses to you, but it also warns of false prophets. And the first thing he says is, if a prophet says something's going to happen and it doesn't happen, don't worry about it. Right? What validates the prophetic gift? That the things you say come to pass. And so here, Micah reminds them of that to lay out this book as being divinely inspired and pertinent, not as a testimony of history, but as a warning about the future. And then lastly, we've been watching this zoom in, so the whole world, Israel and Judah, because of sin, Jerusalem and Samaria, the capital cities, and then what is the sin, verse 7, all her idols will be broken to pieces, all her temple gifts Will be burned with fire. I will destroy all her images since she gathered her, since she gathered her gifts from the wages of prostitutes as the wages of prostitutes they will again be used. And so it is judgment here on idolatry. And again, that's understandable in Samaria. Right? Do you remember what Rehoboam does? Rehoboam is this raised up king who's going to take over the ten tribes because of Solomon's sin. And Rehoboam goes, you yeah, know, the temple's in Jerusalem. And if they keep going there, and if they see the glory of Jerusalem, and if they see the glory of the line of David, they're going to go, you know what? You're great, Rehoboam, but we're going back. And so he goes, you know what I need? He says, I need my own place of worship. And so he builds two golden calves. One he sets up in Dan. Uh, the other, if I remember right, he sets up in Beersheba. He sets up these places of worship to keep people in the land. But it's idolatry. And so again, you read this, it makes sense, but look at verse 8. Because of this, I, Micah, will weep and wail. I'll go about barefoot and naked and howl like a jackal and moan like an owl, for Samaria's plague is incurable and it's spread to Judah. You see that? There's a contagion factor here. And so Judah, again, with the temple, with the sanctioned and designed by David temple, with the decorated and glorious by Solomon temple, with the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God and the priesthood and the sacrifices laid out in Leviticus, he says, I think you've caught something. I think you're infected. In fact, there's a play on here, not just of the idea of idolatry spreading to Judea, but also judgment. And that's a little bit easier than this. Notice again what it says, for Samaria's plague is incurable, it has spread to Judah, it has reached the very gate of my people, even to Jerusalem itself. See, here's what happens. As is often the case with conquerors, it doesn't matter if God put them up to it or not. They take out the ten tribes of Israel and they go, you know what, there's a little bit more land over there. And they keep pushing and one of the things we don't think about, I already mentioned Hezekiah and how he's surrounded. You may remember this story, right? The, the general of the Assyrian army says, I hope you like drinking urine. It's quite the story. Okay. As he's surrounded, he goes to Isaiah for help. And Isaiah says, hey, pray to the Lord and he's going to deliver you. And Hezekiah, Hezekiah does so. But the city of Jerusalem in the center of Judea is surrounded. Do you know what that means? It means most of Judah is already conquered. It means most of the cities of Judah have already fallen, and their remnants, the survivors, have retreated into the gated city of Jerusalem, its capital. Okay. And so here, 
getting this plague that gets to the very gates is not just the sins of the northern tribes, it's the judgment of the northern tribes. Okay? And again, it's distinctly because of the ministries of Micah and Isaiah that Jerusalem is fair. But then he begins to weep and to mourn for all of these cities. Before we look at the cities and what they mean, I want you to notice what happens in verse 16. Shave your head in mourning for the children in whom you delight. Make yourself as bald as the vulture, for they will go from you into exile. That's the fate of Jerusalem. Yes, they were spared, but the sin persists. So is the plan for judgment. God is patient, but he is not indifferent. So he will bring about judgment. It will culminate in exile. And how should you know it's coming? As I told you the last time, Jim. I was right there. And so the issue here is one of idolatry. Now, again, all of these cities, starting in verse 10 all the way through verse 15, they're places you've never been to. They're places you don't know. Uh, many of them are places that don't really have a modern equivalent. They're just little towns. But here's the things you need to know of them. One, they're all in the land of Judah. These are not cities in Samaria or in, in the northern tribes around Samaria. These are in the southern tribes of Judah. Second, they're all within spitting distance of Moresheth, Micah's hometown. You see that in verse 1? The Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth. So what I'm telling you is, his original audience, these are the neighboring cities. It might as well be San Bernardino and Redlands and Running Springs. Crestline. Okay. They are the areas around the people he is talking to. In fact, they may even be the areas that these people call home. Okay. So this is talking to his neighbors about their future. And then the second thing you need to understand is that every one of these sentences, every city that's named, Micah turns into a wordplay. And my new NIV actually gives me every single one of those word plays. But my last Bible did. But the reason they don't just put them right in the text is because then you wouldn't know where the places were, right? You may not be able to know where the house of bread is, but you know where Bethlehem is, right? And so it can be a challenge here to understand, but I'll just give you an example. Uh, look what it says in verse 11. Pass by naked in shame, you who live in Shephir. Shephir means beauty. What he says is beauty town, it's about to get ugly. But there's another reason why this doesn't really register with us, even if we were to translate it this way, it's because it comes off like a dad joke. <laughs> but what you need to remember is that for Israel, names are destiny. Right? You see this everywhere in Scripture. When parents name their kids, it's a big deal, and miraculously, because God is involved, a lot of times they live up to their names, good names or bad names. Right? Jacob, the heel catcher, the dirty, rotten thief, is exactly what he's called. Right? And that's why God changes his name and makes him the one governed by God. Okay? Abram, the father of many, becomes Abraham, the father of many nations. Both of them ironic for a guy who cannot conceive the wife of their okay? And yet, he fulfills his destiny. What Micah does here is he takes aspirations and turns them into omens. He takes the names and he says, everything you've dreamed about your city, everything you related to in your city is going to fall apart. And what is the reason? The reason is idolatry. I don't think that's surprising. I don't think I shocked anyone. I think you've read some of the prophets enough to know that idolatry is a recurring major theme in the books of the prophets. But there is something surprising about this. Because after chapter 1, Micah doesn't talk about idolatry anymore. Like ever. The first chapter, that's the clear focal point, right? Are there any other sins listed here? Is there anything else that Micah wants to talk about? No, it's, it's heart and center. He takes a while to pull back the curtain and go, ta-da! But when he does, it's idolatry. 
The rest of the book also focuses on basically one category of sin, and that's injustice. I'll show you what I mean. Look at chapter 2, verse 1, right after chapter 1. Woe to those who plan iniquity, those who plot evil on their beds. At morning light they carry it out because it's in their power to do it. They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them. They defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. What's the problem here? The problem is powerful people laying in their beds and dreaming about stealing other people's property. Look with me at chapter one, or chapter three, verse one. Then I said, listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, should you not embrace justice, you who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who eat my people's flesh, strip off their skins and break their bones in pieces, who chop them up like meat for the pan, like flesh for the pot. The idea is not here that Judah has mistakenly voted for the cannibal party, right? The idea is that powerful people, instead of providing for citizens, are stripping them bare of everything they need to live. Okay. Look at verse 9, same chapter. Hear this, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, who despise justice and distort all that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness. Her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets fortune for money. Yet they look to the Lord's support and say, it's not the Lord among us, right? And so they are using, again, the systems, the politics, the government of power, the courtroom, to take advantage of people, even though they say, we're totally safe because this is God's city. Look with me in chapter 6, verse 10. Am I still to forget your ill-gotten treasures, you wicked house, and the short ephah, which is accursed? Shall I quit someone with dishonest scales with bags of false weights? What does he say here? He says the marketplace is unjust. He says those who are dealing in the market have one measure of weights for incoming items and one measure of weight for outgoing items to make sure they get a bigger profit. Deceptive marketplace. Marketplace strategies. Look at chapter 7, verse 2. The faithful have been swept from the land. Not one upright person remains. Everyone lies in wait to shed blood. They hunt each other with nets. Both hands are skilled in doing evil. The ruler demands gift. The judge accepts bribes. The powerful dictate what they desire. They all conspire together. Okay, at this point, it's just abject mistreatment. Every man for himself. Do whatever you have to to get by. Okay. And so, from chapter 2 all the way through chapter 7, the primary focus is all things that we would call injustice. Oppression. Taking advantage of other people. Using power abusively. In fact, almost every commentator I've ever read would tell you that the key verse of the book of Micah is in chapter 6, verse 8. What does it say? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Micah's saying, God doesn't have any mission for you. This isn't new or novel. You don't have to find a new way to be. You already know what God expects of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So how is it if Micah's entire ministry is woven through the concept of injustice that here in chapter 1 is not mentioned? And how is it that when he lays the framework of his introduction, the foundation introduces the primary theme of the book, here he talks about, about idolatry. Let me make some suggestions on answers I don't think think work. First, I don't think he's giving priority and saying idolatry is important and justice is almost as important. I don't think it's as if Micah is trying to convey, look, God is upset that you mistreat one another, but when you worship other gods, he takes it personally. I also don't think that Micah is laying out a framework for two parallel sins, equally bad, 
equally problematic. I think in chapter one, he is laying out these foundations. I think in chapter one, he is illuminating the disease of which injustice is only the symptom. And see, this is weird for us, right? Because when we think about worship, we think about religion. And when we think about injustice, we think about social relationships. When we think about idolatry, we think about a vertical. When we think about justice, we think about a horizontal. Here's the thing. You will never dehumanize another person unless you've deified something that is not God. That's the only way that you can understand the major themes of the book of Micah. That idolatry is a foundational sin that is manifesting in injustice. That's why Judah and Jerusalem is so confused, because they're like, what are you talking about? We worship Yahweh. It's written on our doorposts. We go to prayer three times a day. We have the priesthood and the sacrifices. We have the temple. And yet he, uh, to quote from Jeremiah, he says, yeah, your Jerusalem, your city of peace is actually a city of blood. Right? And so it makes their worship of Yahweh questionable. But let's go back to the idea that it is what we deify that makes us dehumanize other people. Here's how this works. Idolatry in the Old Testament was relatively easy to spot. How did you know who your neighbor worshipped? You just went into his house, there's a statue right there. But the gods represented in those statues are actually really contemporary. If you study the gods of the land of Canaan, powers of Assyria, if you study the Greek pantheon, it doesn't really matter. The gods are all personifications of incredibly contemporary things. Things like fertility and sex. Things like power and success. Things like wealth and security. And so idolatry in the modern world isn't always identified religiously. There's not a representation that you put on your shelf, but it is present and it is everywhere. And here's a good way to spot it. What you worship is what makes life worth it. It's what makes life meaningful. It's the thing that if you lost, you didn't just lose it, all is lost. It's the thing that you feel like because you don't have, you're vulnerable, and if you just had, you'd be secure. It's the thing that makes sense of life, that makes life the good life, and again, without it, you are nothing. What does that do to our neighbors, those who are created in God's image, the ones that Jesus calls us to love as ourselves? It turns them into either vehicles or obstacles. That's the language of Paul Tripp. I find it to be helpful. Vehicles, meaning you primarily think of the ways that you can use people to get what you want. Obstacles, meaning you primarily think of people as standing in the way between you and And the thing about injustice is it doesn't just dehumanize the victim. It absolutely does that. It also dehumanizes us. Right? It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. This is just what you have to do in the rat race. Do you hear that subhuman language? And so if we are going to have a uniquely Christian view of what's wrong with this world, we have to recognize that the sins against one another, the sins of the powers that be, the sins of oppression, the manifestation of injustice and avoidable poverty and these types of things are always rooted in idolatry. They are inherently theological. They don't just say something about your neighbor. They say something about stuff. And what they say about that stuff is that it is ultimate. C.S. Lewis understood this. Listen to his insight. All that we call human, all that we call human history, money, poverty, ambition,
prohibition, war, prostitution, classes, empire, slavery, is the long, terrible story of human beings trying to find something other than God which will make them happy. What this means is any approach to justice, to setting things right, that doesn't get this, is prone to a shallow justice that's probably injustice. There's a novel called The Children of Men. There's a film too. They're not actually that related, even though it's based on the source material. Uh, the filmmakers wanted to strip every Christian idea and image from the book, and they made the film, and they pretty much succeeded. I actually like the film. I just don't like it in relationship to the book. But P.D. James was a woman who lived just a few decades ago and realized that her modern English world couldn't comprehend the virgin birth. And so she wanted to write a story where they would get what it was like, behold, Emmanuel. So she wrote a story about a world that stopped having the ability to have kids. Nobody knew why. In fact, when the story opens in 2021, interestingly enough, no kids have been born for decades. And the ruler of England, who is no longer royal, but called the steward of England, that's not right. What's he called? It's not keeper either. Anyways, we'll call him the steward. The steward of England's basic job is death with dignity on a universal scale. Let's just make sure, since we're all going to slowly die out, that we live well on the way to death. But you discover very quickly that although that is the message, that the way that that's carried out is incredibly unjust. And so foreigners to England are basically reduced to household slaves. When they get too old for it, they're deported. Criminals, even those just suspected of crimes, are sent to the Isle of Man to just figure it out for themselves. They set up a massive suicide program so that anybody who wants to take their life can with ceremony and without pain. But as is always the case in stories like these, the powers that be start using it to put rabble-rousers to death quietly and saying that they chose to take their lives. And so a small group known as the Five Fishes organizes with the hope of overthrowing the warden, that's what he's called, the warden of England and the powers that be to set things right. And so their desire is to expose all of these things that are going on. And they do it through periodicals and other ways. But one of the characters is a man named Ralph. And Ralph, uh, his desire is to overthrow the powers that be, and he wants to make himself the warden of England. And you find out that he doesn't actually want to be the warden of England to set things right. He actually thinks everything they're doing is probably the only thing you can do. He just wants to be the one in power. There's a conversation early in the book where the main character is talking with Ralph, who's really the only atheist of the group. And you find out that Ralph grew up in church and he left it at 12 and never looked back. And so the main character says, well, when, when you left God behind, what did you replace it with? He said, well, nothing, I didn't need to. But Ralph is wrong. And you discover this because as the story goes along, you discover that Ralph's wife is miraculously pregnant. Mystifyingly, inexplicably, suddenly pregnant. And Ralph starts to realize that this kid is the tool to the campaign that will make him warden instead of the warden. Until he finds out the child isn't his. And as soon as he finds that out, he rats out the five fishes to the warden. Why? Because power is Ralph Scott. You guys get this. I just told you about a book you've never read. How about one you have read? Do you remember the ending of The Hunger Games? It's one of my favorite pieces in the last decade of literature because it surprised me so much to read a dystopian novel written in America. But here's the thing. What happens is this nation is torn apart by war and the victors take, the, take those who lost the war and perpetually punish them through games 
gladiatorial-like games competing to the death with other victims. And so there's a party of this oppressed people who raise up to overthrow things, and eventually they win, and Katniss Everdeen is at the center of this. But she discovers that President Coyne, this publicly elected leader of the revolution, who has just won and is going to rule the new world, that her plan is to reverse the Hunger Games. Because it's the only way to keep them safe. They need to send the message that you're no longer the conquerors. You now belong to us. And so it gets to the point where President Coyne is standing at the assassination of the head of the Capitol, President Snow. And she's asked Katniss to do the honors. For the last 24 hours, Katniss has just been swimming. And in the very pinnacle of the book, she pulls back her bow, uh, her bow and she puts an arrow right through the heart of President Coyne. Because she realizes that a change in power is not a change in circumstance. That, by the way, is what makes that book a dystopian and not a utopian. Because the problem persists. Now, this is how G.K. Chesterton put it. He was talking about the Magnificat, the prayer of Mary when she finds out that she's miraculously pregnant with Jesus. And this is what she says. God, you set down the mighty, the proud, and you lift up the humble. And Chesterton says, every revolution is built on the first, to put down the mighty, to put down the proud. And he says, every revolution fails because it fails to do the second. It just puts pride right back in its place. Do you see why this is an issue? Because if what you worship is safety or security or status or these types of things, then the only reason you want to be on the top and instead of the bottom is to be on the top. And you can only have a top if there's a bottom. So there's implications for us tonight that are significant. The first is, again, that issues of injustice in the public square are issues of worship and therefore are, are our business. But you cannot separate the two great commandments to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That they are lived together. And as we'll see later in Micah, we'll see that proper worship of the true God leads to proper living, which means justice. But the second thing we need to understand here is that if we are to deal with injustice in the world, we have to begin with injustice in the midst of God's people. Who is Micah written to? Uh, the people of God, not Assyria, not messy, gross, violent, despicable Assyria, but to the people of God. In this passage, he says that he weeps, and at a later point, he actually calls the entire earth to weep. Why? Why should the whole world weep at the judgment of Israel? Because Israel is the hope of the world. Because if those who were designed to be light had become darkness, how great is that darkness? And the truth is, in the Western world anyways, any great transition, any step forward towards human flourishing has been began with the church and the church's repentance. Let me recommend another book for you. The Diary of John Woolman. My accent, whatever it is, makes that really hard to understand, but Woolman is like wool, the fabric man, Woolman. John Woolman was the first abolitionist who you never heard of. He was a Quaker, and he came to deep conviction that the African slave trade was wrong. And so he started to tra uh, travel from Quaker meeting to Quaker meeting. And Quakers don't have pastors, they don't have preaching, they have circle times. And at the circle times, if the spirit leads you, you can stand up and you can share. And so he got permission from the leaders of these groups and went from group to group, trying to encourage the Quakers to get rid of their slaves. And as far as I can tell, John Woolman is the first American conscientious consumer. And so when he traveled to England, he calculated how much cheaper his ticket was because of the African slave trade and paid the difference. He did not want to be a part of this system, 
And he wanted specifically his Quaker and brothers, brothers and sisters to step out of the game. And this is before so-called Christians in the South started justifying slavery. The abolitionist movement in England is no different. In fact, did you know that Granville Sharp, one of the great abolitionists, also wrote a rule of interpreting the Bible, the Granville Sharp rule? Judgment, Paul says, begins with the house of God. Revival begins with the house of God. It is when we rediscover the good news that we can communicate rightly that the good news is good for our neighbors. So the only way that we can address injustice in the world is to tear out the idolatry in the church. It has to begin there. It has to start there. And that's not to say that all of your motives must be pure or you must be completely sanctified before you can make, difference, make a difference in the world. I'm just saying that the fight for justice begins in your hearts and then it spreads to your community. Now that's not all that Micah has to tell us about justice, but I want to reiterate again that it is the foundation. It's also a really good reason to worship Jesus. Because what we find when Jesus walks this earth, and remember that Colossians tells us that he is the very image of God, which means not just that Jesus looks like God, but also that God looks like Jesus. And we watch him as he navigates the powers and principalities, the idolatry of this world, as he lives without wealth, as he chooses a path of weakness instead of power, as he identifies with those who have no status, as he remains entirely celibate and sexually pure. We discover nonetheless that he has life and the lack of all of those things takes nothing from Jesus. And more than that, those who have those things can do nothing to stop it. Right? And so he's crucified with the powers that be, with all of their mixed motives, with all of their idolatrous hearts, and it does nothing. Because three days later, Jesus rises from the dead. This is what it says in Colossians. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. It says that Jesus disarmed the powers and principalities by exposing them on the cross. The first thing I want you to notice about that is he did it by exposing them on the cross, not in the resurrection. The cross itself was the defeat of the powers and principalities because he showed them for what they were, not God. But the great thing is it's not just simply, and we could do this, we could turn to the New Testament and talk about how Jesus, like Micah, calls us to justice. It's more significant than that. It's because of what Jesus has accomplished. Jesus makes us just. He transforms us. He gives us a new heart of flesh, which is not a heart of idolatry, but a heart of pure worship in spirit and in truth. And he's devoted to conforming you to his image so that you would think like him, so that you would talk like him, so that you would love like him. But we should question ourselves or anyone else who says that they worship Jesus and lives like those who worship Baal. Those who, instead of loving their neighbors, see them as vehicles or obstacles, see them as opportunities or threats, see them as unnecessary for a life of following Jesus. Let's pray. Oh God, so often we turn to a word for information on the issue. But what you call us is to transformation. So I pray, Lord, that in our hearts tonight it would be nothing less. 
to pray that you may prove that this is not just a lecture, but the living word of God that cuts through joint and marrow and discerns even the motives of our heart. I pray that we would know you, and in knowing you, we would become like you. For that, we need your help. We need your spirit to bring conviction. We need your promises, because when we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We need you to discern them, because sin makes life complicated. So righteousness may be simple, but in its application, it takes wisdom. And ultimately, finally, completely, we just need you. We just need you so much. So we thank you, Lord. That's why you came. That's what you're about. And that's what you'll accomplish in Jesus' name.